Hey guys, welcome to uh, book review. I think this is uh, 20 or 21. I kind of lost count. I'm going to have to check when I get back to the house. Anyway, this is the second one I've done today. Bangkok Days, The Sojourn in the Capital of Pleasure by Lawrence Osborne. Alright, I'm going to sit back. Um, now, I really, enjoyed, uh, ooh, I really enjoyed this book. Um, honestly, of the books that I've done, that I've reviewed on this channel, uh, it's one of the better ones that uh, I've done, or that I've read. Maybe like, In Siberia was really good, Peter Hessler's stuff was really good. But what I really enjoyed about this is it was definitely, definitely something that I'm looking for in travel literature, which is connecting a place to an emotional state. Um, and not necessarily in a... Uh, um, a way that is fatalistic like if you move to this place it's going to be this but just like a very strong um connecting the outer world to the inner mental state um oh man this sun is really bright um well anyway as the uh title says it takes place in uh bangkok and initially i thought this uh, book was going to be really deprived because the subtitle said uh, Sojourn in the Capital of Pleasure. I thought it was all going to be about him just really going out there and banging chicks and, you know, all that kind of stuff. But uh, it certainly covered that aspect of it, but from a much more objective perspective, like uh, kind of um, both how he felt uh, uh, guilty in the, in the very few times that he uh, did engage like a hooker, but guilty, but at the same time not overwhelmed with guilt um and he also focused on like i guess the more common johns who uh lived in his neighborhood and um just kind of their motivations and you know for example i think there was this guy albert who uh had lived in australia um and whose wife had died and had enough money to get by but really had like no relatives and had no connections and just kind of um Moved to Tibet, I guess, as the old Buddhist saying goes, uh, um, when you're uh, when you're alive, you're a drop um, in the sky of rain falling down, but when you die, you reach the ocean and it's just placid, like you just merge into nothingness. And I think that's what this Albert kind of did. Like uh, um, he certainly still had his emotions and th this is not the author but the, the guy i'm talking about had his emotions and uh you know he painted um but it was just kind of sweet how this guy kind of went there to die and not die in uh, a decrepit uh um you know retirement home uh but actually uh was trying to find some sort of not necessarily peace but uh calm way to end his life which is kind of sweet and sad of course this was also the guy that you know would regularly get like hookers and stuff uh, uh just to provide him company and also to, to sleep with but also just to provide him sort of companionship um and then they talked about this guy named like uh magentus it's really like about four main characters in the book and then there's but that's, that's not what strictly the book is based around. Like, there are these four main characters, but then there's also just a lot of stuff. Him uh, doing, like, observation or just, like, meeting people in one-off circumstances and stuff. So, uh, this guy, McGinnis, um, was sort of more the uh, non-redeeming value type. Like, um, he had uh, moved from England and was a real punter out there. I think that's the right word. Um, and just kind of a sleaze ball and slime ball, but also very uh, engrossing and engaging at the same time. Like he would constantly lie about his profession and where he made money. Um, and was always sort of either had like a lot of money that you didn't know where it came from or was completely broke. But like, uh, it wasn't, I mean, he probably was doing stuff illegal, but it wasn't like, it was just all very gray. And he's just kind of a, a very engaging, intriguing character. Um, let's see, and then there was also uh, the Spaniard, uh, who only appears uh, kind of towards the beginning of the book. Um, 
and then uh, kind of towards the end, uh, and he's sort of an artist who everyone thinks is a big deal, but uh, turns out to do very banal uh, bird motifs, and really has not had any, uh, they suspect him of doing like the big hotel in the city, doing like a huge mural there and getting paid a bunch of money. But uh, it turns out that he just uh, was just kind of scraping by doing bird murals. <laughs> uh, and at the end, uh, his last encounter with uh, Lawrence actually asks him for uh, 50 bucks, <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny. Um, and then the last guy, uh, they just named the Spaniard as the Spaniard, I think. But the last guy, whose name I can't remember, doesn't live in Bangkok, but actually lives in Cambodia. And is running a barely getting by uh, kind of like countryside retreat. I wouldn't even really call it a resort. It's basically like a homestay. Um, that he comes to uh, Bangkok to try to uh, uh, cold call or cold entice uh, foreigners to come out to his place in, in uh, Cambodia. And they say he normally gets uh, like three to four uh, total tourists a year. And that somehow keeps him keeps him going on so he's kind of like on the edge of poverty as well um okay so those are the sort of the four main characters but what i really wanted to talk about was um how this book really really penetrates like um penetrates the emotional field uh well I mean, it's, it's really, the reason I'm struggling is because it really is kind of a kaleidoscope of the city, and if there is going to be a city that is a kaleidoscope, kaleidoscope, it would be Bangkok because of just all of the different perspectives and different angles and ways you don't even really know, like, uh, um, is this what it appears to be or uh, is it a figment of my imagination, you know, even singular objects can be viewed as kaleidoscopes, let alone an entire city, which has thousands of different things to see. Millions, really. Um, but also the, the, how that matched the kaleidoscope of emotions that was uh, uh, within the author and the author observed within other people. You know, everything from uh, uh, huge, like a huge protest that was going uh, on downtown against uh, the military rule in the country at the time, which um, wasn't really that strongly felt like it was a military rule, but it wasn't like totalitarian. It was just barely hanging on like, and the other side of that, which is, uh, um, just these, uh, kind of brightly lit malls that these people, that these, you know, hardcore protesters would go to across the street from the main square on their off time and go to like the Nike store or whatever. I mean, it's just, it was great kind of a, a, a contrast between the two. Um, or, you know, like, uh, he'd go to, uh, this area of town that, uh, was full of bars, uh, bars specifically like girly bars, like prostitution bars. Um, and the thing that, that was funny about this was, uh, uh, all of these bars, I'd say like 10 bars on this one street or 10 or 15 bars all had a, uh, famous European painting motif. So, like, one was the Gauguin and one was the Monet. And, you know, like, they'd have, like, bastardized versions of these paintings within the uh, uh, walls of these places. Um, and, uh... Oh, we're on time. This might be a two-parter. Uh, and, you know, like, they really wouldn't... Like, none of, none of the, the uh, Johns or the prostitutes would really know, like who this person was, but it was just a motif to kind of add some, you know, make it stand out and add some class to the place, I guess. I don't know. Um, let me think. There was one other story I specifically wanted to tell. Uh, let's see, was it the Johns? I don't know. You know, it talks a lot about, like, Buddhism and um, kind of the differences in the way that uh, Buddhism views sexuality versus... Uh, you know, the West, the Christian tradition. Um, yeah. Well, okay, so what else do I want to say? I really want to say some more stuff about this. You know, he obviously tries out all the food and stuff, which is just kind of standard. Um, 
There's really, really something I want to say. Yeah, and he just kind of takes, you know, like, night walks around the place, and not everyone seems to be employed. Like, there seems to be a pretty high unemployment rate, or people that are sort of employed in marginal professions. Um, yeah, I don't know. We also, you know, one thing that's good about the book, too. Oh, I know what I wanted to say, um, and this will lead into this. One, uh... One of the things that's good about the book is how he views both the uh, 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 aristocracy um, and the wealth of the country. You know, for a while he lives in a a guest house of um, the niece of the prime minister, which is on, like, this huge estate. In another time period, he lives in, like, this little um, dinky, run-down apartment. Uh, that's kind of like a uh, gaijin or foreign or a, it's not gaijin that's a uh, japanese foreign whoa hey okay i'm gonna i'm gonna cut this off